only because he believed in creation. Last week, I sat in the living room of Robert Gentry, who worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories in Knoxville, Tennessee. He wrote major articles for magazines like Science and Nature, published all sorts of articles in major science magazines until they discovered he was a creationist, and his funding was shut off at the spigot instantly. Call him up. Robert Gentry. He's got a website, halos.com, H-A-L-O-S, and he'll be glad to talk to you about it. There are case after case where people are excommunicated because they no longer hold the faith of evolution. It is a religion. Only members in good standing are considered worthy of judgment. So if you don't believe in evolution, therefore you can't be a scientist, therefore all scientists believe in evolution. They define the terms, and of course, if we're under those ground rules, of course they're going to win the war in, in that, that situation. It att evolution attempts to provide basic answers to the questions of life. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going when we die? It is a religion. It deifies nature, Gaia hypothesis, and evolution. Those words are always capitalized, capital E. It's a religion. Majority opinion is somehow considered proof that it happened. I hear this all the time when I do debates. It's like, well, everybody believes in evolution. Oh, well, first place, not everybody believes it. Second place, even if everybody did, that's not proof that it happened. And these professors, and I appreciate Dr. Hartman coming tonight, but I'll tell you, the vast majority, you told me you asked quite a few to come tonight, and they wouldn't do it. We probably get a thousand to one refuse to debate, as opposed to the, the few that will come debate. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity tonight. Uh, Darwin, when he was 22 years old, graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. He set sail on board the Beagle in 1831. As he sailed around, he came to the Galapagos Islands, and he noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches based upon their beak shape. Charlie concluded that probably all the finches had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> and then he concluded that this probably proves the birds and the bananas are related. Charlie said in his book on page 170, it is a truly wonderful fact that all plants and all animals throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Would, would I be quoting this correctly to say that he is claiming that the birds and the bananas are related? I don't want to put any words into his mouth, but that is what he's saying, isn't it? Everything is related. See, what Charlie observed is called microevolution. And the whole argument here tonight is going to be over the definition of this word evolution. The kids, I think, are being deceived by the slippery definition of that word. Microevolution says dogs produce a variety of dogs. Roses produce a variety of roses. Folks, that's a fact. It happens. The Bible said it would happen. Ten times in the first chapter, God said the plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. And I think because of the Genesis definition here, if it's able to reproduce, it's the same kind. But you asked for a definition of kind? I gave you one. I think if it's able to reproduce, a dog and a wolf are capable of reproducing. They're the same kind of animal. Now, they're classified as different species, but they are the same kind of animal. This word evolution has lots of different meanings. There's cosmic evolution, that's the Big Bang. Some people say, that's not what's in the books. Oh, I, I taught science 15 years. Trust me, it's in there, folks. The textbook says 18 to 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. This is a vital part of their theory to explain where matter comes from. And then you'd have to have chemical evolution. If the Big Bang produced hydrogen and helium, how do we get the other 92, uh, 90 elements? We see carbon decay, potassium decays to argon, uranium decays to lead. All the evidence we see is for things decaying without an enormous amount of input of energy. In stars, under intense pressure and heat, maybe higher elements can be created for a few moments. But where did the energy come from? There'd have to be a long period of chemical evolution. Then you'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen one star form. We've seen lots of them blow up, but nobody's ever seen one form. So the evidence is against this stage of evolution. Then we'd have organic evolution. That's the origin of life. Nobody's ever seen non-living material come alive. This is not part of science. It's part of what they believe in. It's a religious worldview. Textbooks teach 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. Millions of years of rains created great oceans. This is what the books say. I'm not making this up. I collect the books. I have hundreds of them. Millions of years of rains created great oceans. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> well, I guess it is. Totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. That's how slow it is. This one says, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. This is a college textbook. So basically, the evolutionists believe that the humans, the birds, the crocodiles, all had a common ancestor. Now, they're welcome to believe that. Honestly, I don't care what they believe. 
But I'm sick and tired of them using my tax dollars to spread this kind of propaganda in our school system when it's not science. Charlie Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless and immediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Boy, you're right about that, Charlie. There should be billions of intermediate varieties. Where are they? Even David Ropp, who's a strong believer in evolution, said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has di died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, <gasps> you're kidding. Fantasy in the textbooks? Oh, believe me, they are full of fantasy. I would like to point out, if you find a fossil in the dirt, like the fossil replicas on the table over here, all you know is it died. <laughs> you don't know, for, you know where it died at, and you know where it ended up being buried at, but that's all you know. You don't know that it had any kids, let alone different kids. You found a bone in the dirt. Okay, it died. And I'd like to ask the question, why is it you think, think bones you find in the dirt can do things that animals today cannot do? Monkeys today are still having babies. Make another human. I want to watch it this time. Apes are still having babies. Humans are still having babies. Everything's still having babies. Why don't we ever see an animal produce a different kind? Why is it it can only happen long ago and far away? Let's see it happen. It's not observed. Fossil evidence wouldn't hold up one second in a court of law. The problem is evolution doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. It has to be stuck into the brains of these un unsuspecting freshmen when they go to college. And they don't have the option because that teacher's going to give them a grade. But I'll tell you, if, they, if we had to go to court of law and they said, where's the evidence? Where's, what's the best evidence that any animal has ever changed to a different kind of animal? The best evidence they have, they claim they have, is the fossil record. And yet there is no fossil evidence that any animal ever produced a different kind of animal. And it, like I said, if you find a fossil in the dirt, that's not, fossil, that's not evidence that it had any kids at all, let alone different kids. So we have cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, stellar evolution, organic evolution. Then we would have to have macroevolution. That's changing from one kind of animal to another. Nobody has ever observed that. Finally, we have microevolution. Now, the first five are religious. The last one is science. And the kids are going to be confused with the definition of the word evolution. There's a lot of varieties of dogs, and they probably had a common ancestor, and it was a dog. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but it's still a dog. And a three-year-old can tell you it's the same kind of animal. Okay, boys and girls, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> well, duh. It's the same kind of animal. Uh, what's going to happen, though, the teachers are going to give thousands of examples of microevolution. Like he mentioned, we're different than our parents, and our jaws are smaller, and the wisdom teeth don't fit. Well, that, that's, a, that's a micro change. We're still a human. He's giving examples of microevolution, and then he's going to try to make you take a giant leap of faith and logic into believing that that somehow is mystically evidence for macroevolution. And it just isn't. Macroevolution is a fantasy based on imagination. It doesn't happen. And they spend a lot of time arguing about where is the line between micro and macro. Well, I don't know exactly where the line is in some cases. I think that might be a good field of research. But that certainly doesn't mean the other ones are included. See, the other five definitions are smuggled into the textbook, writing on the coattails of examples of macroevolution. They're just smuggled in, folks. There's no evidence for them at all. I defy somebody to show me some evidence. We've got no argument with truth. Man, I love truth. I love science. But evolution has no scientific evidence to back it up. Truth comes from God. I'd like to see some evidence to back, back up evolution. We welcome any challenge. I have a standing offer. We offer a quarter million dollars for proof for evolution. I mean, come on, let's have it. And I, I, I pay for my tickets to fly to do these debates. It's so hard to find an opponent. I, honestly, I don't, I'm not a professional debater. I've never had a class on debate in my life. And usually the evolutionists are a lot smarter than I am. But I'm right, and they're wrong. It's very easy to win a debate like